Welcome to the first data ethics workshop of the Australian Data Science Network. Um, I want to acknowledge um, uh, that QUT uh, stands on Turbal and Ugara lands. Um, they are the First Nation owners of the lands where, where QUT now is. Um, we pay respect to their elders, lores, customs, and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. QUT acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. Um, we are going to, or we are recording this session so that we can share the presentations on australiandatascience.net, um, and you can find previous, uh, previous research spotlights there. And for today's format, so this is a slightly different than the format that was used last year, um, trying something shorter, there'll be four or five minute lightning talks. And we'll just have one or two quick questions after each, um, but we'll save, uh, save uh, additional questions for a longer Q&A and discussion with everyone at the end. Um, and so uh, please you know, post your questions, thoughts, ideas in the chat as we go. And if your question isn't asked uh, initially after the talk, um, uh, we'll probably have time for it in the, the longer Q&A. And our aim is to, uh, to end an hour from now. Yeah, and so um, I'm, I'm super, super excited about the lineup of speakers for today and for um, and for the promise of a discussion. Um, and I'll be kind of introducing the speakers uh, one by one before their talks. Um, and this is the, the order. So let's go ahead and start with Lauren. Um, let me just pull up. Oh, actually, let me stop sharing. And so Lauren, you can start uh, pulling up your slides. And I will pull up your bio. So Lauren Oakden Rayner is Director of Research Medical Imaging at Royal Adelaide Hospital and a researcher at Australian Institute for Machine Learning. She is a radiologist, a medical specialist in South Australia. Her research interests include the application of machine learning to medical images and text, exploitation of our vast but unstructured stores of medical data, and technologies that potentiate education and research activities. Um, and I particularly uh, uh, admire how Lauren's an expert in both machine learning and radiology, and I think that kind of uh, cross-disciplinary expertise is really, really crucial. Um, so feel free to take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, sorry, I've just had a fire alarm going in the background. I think it was a, a drill. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren. I'm, uh, as, as mentioned, going to be talking about explainable AI in healthcare here. Uh, and I've been given the task of trying to fit an argument into five minutes, trying to, trying to convince you that uh, explainable AI in medicine has some specific challenges. Uh, so I'm just going to get started by saying this is based on a paper that I wrote with uh, Marzia Gassemi and Andrew Beam. It was published in uh, Lancet Digital Health last year. Uh, and obviously the discussion in that paper is much more extensive than I can fit in five minutes. So if you want to check that out, please do so. Now, I know that this topic, particularly when I'm talking to data scientists and other technical people, can be quite challenging. Um, I've had some reasonably robust discussions around our viewpoint here. Uh, and so I want to start with a really big disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that I like explainability. So I, I think explainability is really useful. I think the research is really interesting and I think it's really important. Um, this is from last week. There was a, a new paper from Google, explanation by exaggeration using GANs. But I just wanted to get this out of the way that explainability, we're not saying it's terrible. We're not saying it sucks. It just has a very specific challenge. So if I think explainability is good, what is the actual problem? Well, the answer is there's two real ways to think about artificial intelligence. Uh, the first one is a technical framework. This is the way developers would tend to think about AI. Um, you're, you're building a software system and that software system is reasonably predictable. You may not know how it works on the inside, what's happening at each neuron, for example, but you know that if you give it the same input, it will, it will return the same output. So this is what the sort of developer sitting at the computer might think about their systems. Now, from a safety perspective, obviously safety is integral in medicine. We have to think about AI in a different sense as a socio-technical system. So this is a term that comes out of systems engineering. And uh, there's a really good primer at that link if you, if you want to follow along to see that. 
But essentially, a socio-technical system is not only the software artifact itself. It also talks about all the other people involved, the users, the people who make decisions about how AI is used, and even politicians and lawmakers who make laws about it. Because humans are involved, the risk is no longer predictable. You get what are called emergent risks. So with the same input, it depends who the user is or who is making decisions about that AI system's use, how it will impact patients. And this is a really, really important distinction. So in the context of explainability, uh, the technical people tend to have a really good understanding of what explainability is. I'm, I'm not really arguing towards uh, technical people here. So a technical person would say, explainability helps us understand our models. It helps us work out what they're doing. Uh, perhaps it helps us inform better design choices. So if something's going wrong or it's being too focused in one direction, we can change the data or the model and so on. The other groups here, these other three groups who are non-technical, have a completely different understanding of explainability. And this has been held true across every discussion I've ever had with non-technical people. So this is what we call the false hope. Non-technical people believe that explainability is a means of justifying decisions of AI, that we can look at individual explanations rather than just the behavior of the model in aggregate and decide, was it right to make a decision at a given time? And in fact, this has even been written into law. So in the EU, the GDPR says, people deserve information about the logic behind the decisions because presumably this allows them to challenge those decisions when they think that logic was flawed. And uh, surveyed clinicians often say things like, we can see explainability as a means of justifying decisions. So the technical view here is that explainability is descriptive, that it tells us what the model did. But what these non-technical people want is a normative evaluation of AI. Was it right or reasonable that the AI system did that? And this is unfortunately a socio-technical problem because it's the, there's still a person deciding if it was reasonable, which then brings into place human cognitive bias. So as a very quick example, let's look at this Google system that came out last week. This little GIF, it thinks that uh, a cat or an animal is more likely to be a dog if it has short ears and it has large dark eyes. So if you give it an example like this, obviously it's still a cat. We all know it's a cat. If it told us it was a dog, we'd know it was wrong. But even if it says it's a cat and then says, it's a cat, I know that because it's got dog-like ears and eyes. Well, how do you interpret that? How do you determine if that decision was justified? It's really, really hard most of the time, particularly in cases not like this. So in medicine, you don't know the answer most of the time. It's really, really hard to work out if the explanation helps or hinders you justifying the decision. So the false hope, I'm gonna give you a couple of quotes here, one from our paper and one, this one I think is the most important quote in explainability literature in general. This is from Selbst and Baropis. They said, in most cases, intuition is the unacknowledged bridge between what the technical people know, the descriptive account of explanations and this normative evaluation. We rely on human intuition to decide if that helped or not. And from our paper, here's a bunch of references. Evidence suggests that because we're relying on intuition and not acknowledging that, we lose the ability to detect serious mistakes. We unreasonably increase our confidence in algorithmic decisions, and that can decrease our vigilance for our AI systems. So there's five minutes, hopefully. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, I'll just ask one question now. Um, <laughs> I know you said you you weren't speaking to technical people um, in your talk, um, and that, that part of this gap is kind of around this this difference in expectations. It sounds like um, are there I don't know different areas that you wish explainability researchers would focus on, or kind of different questions that it would be helpful for explainability researchers to ask, um, or is it more just on this kind of gap in understanding between explainability researchers and and other mm -hmm. stakeholders? Look, I think explainability is very good at what it does, and obviously I haven't had time here. In, in the paper, we go into detail about the things that explainability does really well. You know, we've generated new knowledge, we learn lots about our systems, we can actually use it for making systems safer, just not at the user level. Um, and so explainability is really good. And I think the directions it's been going in make sense. There's a lot of mm -hmm. talk about um, whether you can make models inherently explainable versus post hoc explainability and so on. 
And the direction the field moves in, I think is positive. Um, the thing that I would love explainability researchers to stop doing <laughs> is talking to non-technical people in a way that confuses them. And the, you know, the everyone's responsible for this misunderstanding. The, the mm -hmm. non-technical people yeah. haven't paid enough attention, that's for sure. Um, but the way we talk about this as technical people uh, is incredibly misleading, unfortunately, for yes. the people who don't have the technical background to understand. So that, that would be my take home for explainability research. Great, thank you. And then I'll um, just ask one more question now from David. Uh, David asked, uh, would you say that non-tech people see explainability as through the system is reasoning rather than just imitating? No, absolutely. I mean, so in a lot of the papers that we cite and a lot of the literature around this, there's this distinction of one of the quotes I actually cut because I didn't have time for it, <laughs> was talking about the difference between associations and causation. And, you know, that's a big issue in machine learning in general. Um, but here you can see that these systems have found associations. If you look back at that Google cat, when the ears shrink, the background changes. There, there are these associations that these models have learned that don't necessarily make a ton of sense. Um, what you need to do to justify a decision is you need to understand the A to B. You need to understand what that causal pathway was and if having a feature present actually means the decision was right. Um, the, there's a, you know, the whole range of ways that complex associations can really mislead us, unfortunately. Great, thank you. All right, so Ben is up next. Um, so if Lauren, you wanna stop sharing and Ben can start sharing. Sure. And so Ben Hutchinson is a senior engineer in Google's ethical AI team working on artificial intelligence, data, fairness, accountability, and safety. His research includes learning from social sciences to inform the ethical development of AI. Prior to joining Google Research, he spent 10 years working on products such as Google Wave, Google Maps, Knowledge Graph, Google Search, Social Impact, and others. And he has a PhD in natural language processing from the University of Edinburgh. Um, so go ahead, Ben, thank you. Thanks, Rachel, for that intro and uh, thanks for organizing today's event as well and for inviting me. Um, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, Lauren, and I think your, your point about how uh, tech and non-tech communities engage in these conversations uh, and, and uh, is, is such an important one. Um, uh, and today I'm kind of talk on something that's um, kind of about how different technical communities themselves try to communicate across uh, technical boundaries, I think. Um, and, and really with, with this time, um, I really hope to kind of like uh, spark a few questions <laughs> and ideas rather than to present um, and, and present answers. And, and what I'm presenting today is really kind of the outgrowth of a bunch of conversations I've been having with some of my colleagues who are a combination of software engineers and research scientists at Google. Um, and uh, one question we've been asking is about kind of model evaluation practices. So think about how we have these machine, machine learning models and we try to ask, well, is this a good model or not? Is this a model that you know um, is successful or not? And looking at how different technical communities, in our case, how the kind of machine learning research communities and the machine learning kind of application developers who actually want to launch products in the world and uh, trying to think about, do they uh, have or should they have this, the same kind of evaluation practices when they consider models. Um, and the kind of the risk here alluded to with the photos, of course, you know, maybe there are some practices from, from academia or from research that we need to seriously rethink before we kind of uh, launch them into, into um, engineering practice. And in kind of talking with different communities, um, on the one hand, you have this great respect from uh, a lot of the engineers working on products that researchers and academics uh, you know, the pinnacle of achievement in the field, uh, publishing these papers, setting the new trends, inventing the new algorithms. Uh, therefore, copying what they do might seem to be, you know, a copying best practice. And, and really kind of the point I want to make today, if I were to summarize it, is really think carefully about what your goals are <laughs> and then think about uh, what kind of evaluation methodologies uh, are most appropriate for those goals. Um, and... Uh, so I think it's important to, 
to ask this question of what it is that we hope to learn from performing these evaluations of machine learning models. And I kind of really like this quote from Tukey, a far better and approximate answer to the right question, which is often vague, than an exact answer to the wrong question, which can always be made precise. I think even the ways in which we sometimes rush into quantitative analyses uh, in the, the goals of precision, <laughs> the goals of being empirical, uh, but if we're not asking the right questions, uh, if we're not asking the important questions, then no matter how precise our, our answers are, uh, they may not be super useful. Uh, and so the reason I bring it up in this forum today specifically is when I, I often ask questions about uh, responsible AI, about AI ethics, and often when you kind of begin to scratch the surface about, like someone will say, well, is this system, you know, ethical? Or is this system doing the right thing? And then once you start to scratch a little bit under the surface to ask, well, what is this system? What is the goal of this system? Uh, what is the, and often uh, the, I find like a, an absence of clear problem formulation, I would say, um, that often these days uh, people grab huge amounts of data. It's very easy to train a model with this data, but without a clear statement of what it is you want the model to do, uh, it's very hard to, to, first of all, answer, is it like, you know, successful on appropriate evaluation metrics? But then secondly, even more challenging uh, to try and answer the question of, is it kind of ethically appropriate? Is it responsible? And, and as Lauren was saying, this, this really demands uh, contextualization into the kind of social and technical aspects of the system and how they all relate to each other. Um, so with this in mind, in the kind of discussions we've been having with my colleagues, we've been thinking about different reasons and trying to identify two primary reasons why you might want to evaluate a machine learning model. Uh, and really this is meant to kind of, you know, be a bit of a, a provocation to stimulate, you know, a discussion about whether it can be so clear cut but, but at a high level, at a very high level, we think there are certain evaluations that are aimed at discovering, did the learning algorithm do a good job of generalization? Did the learning algorithm uh, do a good job of being robust to certain shifts in the, in the distributional data or so on? There's certain, basically certain types of evaluations we want to know. Your, your objective focus is really the learner, the learning algorithm, maybe the training data, just kind of looking backwards at all these things that produce the model. Uh, and that's a very, very valid uh, pursuit and it's been very important questions for understanding how machine learning works. But on the other hand, you might have questions about well, we've trained this model, we're going to consider deploying it in this application context with a bunch of other people and other technical systems. And we know, well, is the model actually going to be appropriate for that use case? Uh, and that's a very different flavor of question, I think. And so really the, the, the question we have as well, what types of evaluations you use for one context, one flavor of evaluation might not actually be appropriate for the other. Um, and so to kind of explore this question, we decided to look at what kinds of evaluations the machine learning research community does in practice. And so my colleagues and I looked at 200 uh, papers from a, a, a few different recent uh, machine learning conferences in the NLP and computer vision spaces to try and understand, well, how are people evaluating machine learning models in the research community? And we found, we looked at various dimensions of their evaluations and kind of found that uh, the most frequently used metric that was reported was model accuracy. Um, uh, the most, that almost all the papers tested their models on data that was IID with the training data. Um, some did not and some did both. Uh, and very few people are doing things like reporting statistical significance or reporting error bars. So this is our attempt to identify what are, what are the kind of the the normative practices, the, the typical practices within the research community. And then the question we have, well, if our goal is, is the application goal to understand how machine learning model works in an ecosystem, whether it's appropriate for that, um, uh, if that's our actual goal, should we adopt this practice of just measuring accuracy and IA data? And it might seem obvious that the answer is no, <laughs> but we decided to kind of like try and like explore uh, in a bit more detail um, let's, let's assume that it was, hypothetically, let's assume this was a good way for evaluating uh, a model, uh, given this is our goal and given this is our practice. And we thought, well, what kind of assumptions would we have to make to actually justify uh, this practice? Um, and I'm not going to go through these in terms of time, but this is, I think, you know, um, where maybe there's kind of, uh, it opens up a few questions or room for discussion later. But we think, you know, there's a bunch of assumptions that are implicitly getting made uh, if you do see practitioners adopting uh, this practice from, from, uh, from research. And, and more importantly, uh, with each of these assumptions, we think comes a bunch of, of what we've been calling gaps, 
uh, but essentially kind of risks, which might challenge kind of the validity or the ethical appropriateness uh, for the system. Uh, and these include things like ignoring kind of externalities, ignoring uh, social obligations, uh, is also ignoring the aspects of the data which might give, which might enable things like uh, disaggregated fairness analyses or safety analyses, or, or understanding the system is going to impact different social groups in different ways. Uh, so this is kind of where we've been at. Uh, but really, the main takeaway, we think, is trying to understand, when, before you start evaluating machine learning model, understand why you're doing it, who the stakeholders are, um, what assumptions you're sometimes forced to make <laughs> during the process, because you can't always avoid those assumptions. Uh, but in doing so, also make clear whose perspectives are being captured and whose subjectivities are both in the data itself, but also in the teams uh, doing the evaluation. I've lost track of time, so I'm just going to stop there. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, I'll ask, I guess, uh, what, uh, I don't know, is there any advice that you have for, um, oh wait, actually, we got a question from somebody else. Um, let me ask uh, Laurie Ann's question um, instead, and then I'll, I'll ask mine during the longer, longer chat. Um, uh, and Laurie Ann says, many uh, machine learning application designers are trained by ML research papers. Um, ML papers in HCI would address a lot of this. Um, perhaps developers should be trained by more, uh, more by HCI researchers. Do um, you have thoughts or comments on that? I, I totally uh, agree with that question. The, um, uh, and I'll say two things. I think like in my own experience, like at Google, Google tends to try and hire uh, um, a lot of people with machine learning, let's say backgrounds or experience. <laughs> and often that means, uh, uh, people from a research background, um, and so not, and so you get the people from who've spent like their entire career uh, being trained in what might be entirely appropriate for a research kind of context, uh, suddenly being thrown into a quite different context. And so, um, not only do we see engineers having uh, you know learning from from research papers, but often they are the researchers <laughs> who suddenly get thrown in. And they and so I did literally had conversations with researchers where I'd say, well, why, why do you use this trace of metric? Like, why are you reporting F1 score for this classifier? And they're like, well, that's what everyone does. <laughs> and so it's just becomes this norm of the community. Everyone reports F1. And I don't think F1 is a particularly useful metric for application-centered kind of evaluations. Um, I, in my own kind of uh, background, which is, which is mainly natural language processing, I think there's a real dire need for more interaction between HCI and, and NLP specifically. Uh, I won't kind of speak for other disciplines, but I think the ways in which NLP research has become abstracted from its interactions with people. Uh, I think particularly in the last 10, 20 years, um, I think if you look at older research papers in the field, it was less so, um, but now there's an increasing trend to see language as this kind of abstract, uh, fungible kind of resource, yeah. uh, abstract from its human context, its social context, its social interactions. And we definitely need to kind of bring that back into things. Great, thank you, Ben. All right, so I think um, Kathy is up next. Um, so if Kathy, if you wanna start sharing. And Kathy Robinson is a principal research scientist at CSIRO. Her research includes working with indigenous and remote rural communities and scientists to accelerate collaboration and innovation by valuing and enabling diversity in natural resource governance and sustainability with the goals of delivering environmental, economic, cultural, and social benefits. Um, and her background is she has a PhD in geography. Um, so go ahead, Kathy, thank you. Can everyone see? I so I apologise. We don't use Zoom, so I'm not really sure how this is working. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. We can see it. Although, do you want to switch to um, slideshow mode? Of course. Thank you. Sorry. This is awful. <laughs> I'm getting all these um, signals to say get out of here. So I'm really sorry. I think if you go to view, uh, yeah, yeah, towards the right. Oh, actually, maybe I was. No, that's okay. I'm totally wrong on that. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so thank you very much for um, having me. And it's really nice to have this eclectic group. Isn't oh, it? actually, I'm sorry. So I did not <laughs> did not switch to showing your slideshow. Um, <sighs> if you want, you can try unsharing. And then I think when you go to share screen, the slideshow okay. might be a separate. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry about this, folks. I mean, otherwise we can we can still see the slides, um, so we can also do it like this. Is that better? No, that's not better. 
now it's the same. Uh, sorry. We can, let's just go with it like this. Uh, the, this. I'm yeah, sorry. the slides I'm still sorry. show up. Yeah, no, it's still, it looks good. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm just not used to this um, approach, so I apologize. Um, yep, yeah, I'll try that way and see if that works. Anyway, okay, so part of this is, um, we're just going to do a little pivot here. We thought a lot, um, I work um, in the Responsible Innovation Future Science Platform in CSRO, and really that's getting um, AI specialists with um, ethicists and social scientists and geographers to actually start to think about what does ethical AI look like and responsible AI look like in collaboration with users. So I just thought this might be a really um, nice um, addition to this great um, collection of thoughts and talks, um, which is really thinking about this in terms of how do we mean, what do we mean when we talk about ethical AI? And what if we kind of flip that around when we start to ask Indigenous people what they mean about ethical AI? And not only conceptually or principles or frameworks, but actually in application. So that's the kind of take home message here. It's just a journey that we've started. We're really open to collaborators. So please note that this um, work is now being funded for the next few years. So really, really keen to um, explore this question um, with anyone who's, who's also interested in this. So this draws on some work we've been doing in um, uh, what's called the Healthy Country AI um, Collaboration, which has got a cast of thousands. Um, it's got about, I think last count, 96 Indigenous collaborators. Um, we've got everyone who's keen to um, be involved in some of the thinking, as well as some of the applications out on country, which has just been delightful. Um, can you see the next slide? Hopefully. I can't see anyone, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, apologies. So I guess part of this is when you go out on country, um, Indigenous people are tackling some really complex environmental management problems. And some of those are beyond Indigenous knowledge. Um, some of them are really needing to be um, understanding environments in very, very different ways. And they're really curious about using digital data in an inclusive way and in an, an ethical way and using AI to speed up some of that learning and decision-making support. So I guess we've been playing around with this across Northern Australia. And this is an example from Kakadu where we've just started to think about what does that look like in practice? And we've had a few goes at doing that um, with Indigenous partners. So I thought that might be something to reflect on and share with this group. So key to that is to think about that end-to-end -end solution. So I really loved Ben's comment there about how do you evaluate and design models from both uh, the modeler um, to the end user? And what happens if you do that together? And what happens if you do that in an Indigenous framing has been pretty much our question. So some of that data governance and how do we think about you know, care principles of Indigenous data rights and sovereignty and how do we curate data supply chains right through the whole system um, from end to end. When you've got groups who um, speak three languages and English being the third, digital literacy, it's an all time low and you get about a one bar bandwidth on the internet. So there's a whole bunch of technical cross-cultural and, and, and you know, pragmatic questions that we have to ask there. Um, how do we do that so that actually prioritise places and species and areas that they actually want to do? So how do we actually start to design the models not based on, say, a conservation logic, but actually an indigenous logic. How do we prioritise our conservation areas? And so, for example, in Kakadu, we chose culturally significant species and important hunting sites and sacred sites, um, which would guide where the actions would go. Um, and that was quite a critical to a success. And in this case, magpie geese and the impact of an invasive speak, species called paragraphs on those species. It's also looking inside the actual AI tool and how it's designed. Um, and how it translates that information to end users so that it's usable and useful. Um, and so, for example, in Binning, um, who are the local Indigenous owners, they, they don't look at seasons and landscapes the same way as we do. So it's quite critical that we had to curate the data according to the Binning Six seasonal calendar so that data could be seen and shown so that it made sense to those Indigenous people rather than to, say, a Western science. I can go into details later about that, but part of that then was actually showing that data so that it could sit next to Indigenous knowledge assessments. So at the same time we were doing AI, it wasn't sitting as an island. It was really critical that we actually allowed a multiple evidence-based approach where Indigenous knowledge could weave itself with the AI learnings and let Indigenous people work out how they could use both systems um, to make their next decisions. And of course, that sets off that review and adapt process. I'm hoping the next slide has come through. I don't know if it has. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess we've just been playing around with this in various places. Um, I can go into details um, later for anyone who's interested. Um, we've been looking at that sort of trying to trial a prototype though and seeing if we can scale it up or adapt it for different species, for different communities and for different environmental management problems. 
it's been really exciting exercise and in each case it really changes so if you're moving between say space cows which is starting to look at some of the planetary computer working with um you know with, um, the species that move um that really creates its own particular challenges but also cape york communities are very different to kakadu communities so thinking about some of the social cultural context in which a is deployed has been quite critical to that task so I guess I was just kind of curious about throwing this up for people who know about this stuff much more than I do from an AI perspective and ethics perspective. But we're starting to think about what does that look like then? If we were going to start to think about sharing this um, and, and try to develop this with AI, other AI environmental applications, what does this look like when you're working with Indigenous people? We're really excited by thinking this through in terms of um, working with Indigenous stewardship practices knowledge rather than replacing or disempowering it. We're really keen to think about what is kin um, in terms of Indigenous groups and cultural relationships to their country, um, how that actually affects the way in which AI ethics, AI design and AI applications are done and shared. And how does that do go through each step of the process from the design of why we're doing it as well as how we're doing it, the way in which we can appropriately test it um, with users um, and making sure that that is, can be adaptable both in terms of the model and the um, information that it supports. And I guess then trying to think about Indigenous-led pathways for Indigenous AI solutions. So for example, in Kakadu, we use this information because it was really, really hard. If you look at that big, a big floodplain, it gets really hard to actually assess some of those impacts that we've done from paragraphs we control. Whereas once we could throw up some drones and do some AI analysis, it actually sped up some of that information that Indigenous people could use side by side with their own assessments. So it was a lovely way of balancing two action knowledge learning systems. On the left-hand side, we would support Indigenous elders to go out on country and do their own assessments. Meanwhile, at the same time, the AI assessments were provi providing some rapid assessments of magpie geese numbers and other habitat changes um, based on before and after paragraphs control. And so I guess together then we could start to think about how we can weave that in an ethical way um, to support Indigenous-led conservation. For those who wish to find out more, go for it. Um, and uh, there's a few of those links that might help um, guide some of the, the deeper for this. But I just really want to acknowledge the partners that continue to grow um, and um, also to welcome any others who are keen to collaborate. Thank you. I'm going to hope I can stop sharing. I'm sorry, I'm not very Yeah, good. thank you, Kathy. No, that was great. Um, are there any uh, kind of in, any challenge like particularly surprising challenges in approaching this sort of very it sounds like very very collaborative work i think our current frameworks for ethics and you know end user design that we design i couldn't agree more with ben by researchers really aren't very helpful in practice um, and so if you start actually thinking about making this happen in real time like if we're actually out on the ground using this stuff to make on ground decisions you realize all these frameworks are developed by theory, theories that aren't anything to do with cross-cultural conservation. So it's very hard then to start to say, what does that look like? There's also a pragmatics here, you know, <clears throat> in many parts of Indigenous Australia is remote um, and, you know, culturally unique, but also digital literacy is at all time low. I actually think that's an ethical challenge for Australia, but anywho, 85% um, of the planet is under Indigenous stewardship is of the highest conservation asset. In Australia, we've got the lowest digital literacy rates. And so we've got some really interesting cocktail of challenges that are very much about this as well. So we had to, for example, show, show part of this ethics was making sure that AI analysis could be read by people who couldn't read English or had about a prep level um, digital literacy. So I think these sort of really, <laughs> doesn't sound very sexy, but that's the things we've really thought through of, you know, it's, um, it's all in language so that people can actually hear it. We have voiceovers as well to try and talk about it. But these little tiny things, I think are really important to, to guide our next steps. Yeah, thank you. And then um, Joanna has a question. Um, can you say anything around the data issues? Um, who owns the data? Yeah, so we have some ways in which we curate the data so that um, elders at the start, um, we have elders, at the, for example, the one that I've just shown you at NARDAP, we have elders who um, co-lead and co-research with us. And so there's um, gated ways in which that data gets curated and then sent off into the next level of um, data sharing. So at the start, it's just at the community scale, and then the elders have to give the permission for that data to move into the next scale, which is just at the um, ranger station, which is just a sort of small part of near Kakadu and Arnhem Land, um, borderland. And then again, that we have a steering committee then who decides if they can go out to the park of wild, you know, broader scale. So what's nice about that is it um, allows them to think about um, that process, but also that the data is interpreted based on those seasons. 
So magpie geese look very different and, you know, the habitat looks very different depending on whether you're in the dry season. Like now, if you went out to Kakadu now, it'd be pretty wet. Um, and so the country looks very different to say if you went out in June, July. So part of this was allowing that, you know, country-based assessment to go side by side. Yep, so we had those agreements in place. But there's an interesting moment though, because it's a moment when, of course, when we, you know, set up the drones and collect that data, we actually also have to create an ethical um, space of trust. Indigenous people don't analyse the data. Indigenous people didn't design the AI. They had to be part of this endless workshop where we showed each step of the way um, and had to create that ethical space so that we could hold that data on their behalf. And so that, that's an interesting challenge that I think we're all probably facing with all our end users, is how do we keep that ethics and trust going um, as we do that process? Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And there are more questions that we will come back to in the discussion. Um, now it is the time for um, Aaron's talk. Um, you can start uh, sharing your screen, Aaron. Aaron Snoswell is a computer scientist with over a decade's experience in software development, industry research, and robotics. Aaron's PhD at UQ focused on in inverse reinforcement learning. Aaron has a particular research interest in the philosophy and regulation of autonomous decision-making agents agents, and he is a postdoctoral research fellow at the ARC Center for Automated Decision Making in Society at QUT. Um, so go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. I want to talk about uh, near-termism and AI value alignment. So the AI value alignment problem is um, been stated a number of different ways, but in a broad sweep, how can we build autonomous systems with values that are aligned with those of the human race is how Stuart Russell phrases it. And so this sort of extends the uh, agenda of the fairness, accountability, transparency, and machine learning uh, type groups to think as these systems become more and more autonomous, how do we still ensure that they are actually um, being beneficial for human society? And there's a last count, I think, over 300 institutes around the world that claim to be looking at various aspects of this problem or AI safety in some way or another. No, I think it's a really interesting problem. But I think the community and the research around this uh, problem of AI value alignments um, can have some pitfalls. And so as a sort of starting point, the researchers in this space tend to assume very powerful optimization techniques beyond what we have capable um, today and very, very high levels of autonomy. And sort of a common thread here is that this involves a really, really long-term perspective, like maybe thousands or hundreds of years to the future perspective. And this sort of attracts uh, people from disciplines like philosophy, computer science, uh, and also science fiction and pseudoscience. And so what you end up with is the kinds of problems that this community thinks about um, are, for example, Terminator robots or an AI singularity when we have um, an explosion of an artificial intelligent agent, or machines that decide to slaughter the entire human race because they're trying to build as many paper books as possible because we didn't um, tell them what we actually wanted carefully, for example. And so this type of long-termism focus, I think, um, has a place and is useful, but this talks a little bit of a rant, I apologize. I, I think there's some issues and perhaps it's a little bit misguided to sort of exclusively have this long-term focus. And so for one point, um, there's epistemic uncertainty. We actually don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And if you think further and further into the future, that um, uncertainty compounds. And so um, that is one reason for caution about this sort of long-termist thinking. And what actually happens with this research agenda in value alignment is this intentionally or necessarily abstracts away from concrete technologies and applications. Um, and so you end up with papers focused on thought experiments and simulation type experiments, which again, I don't see any problem with that, but I think um, it can be complemented and made more rich uh, by expanding sort of the space of people that think about this AI value alignment type problem. Um, and so to wrap up my rant, I guess, I. I want to advocate for maybe a more near-termism agenda in the research community looking at this um, AI or artificial general intelligence value alignment problem. And so this is very raw thoughts that I've um, had in some early reflections, but it's very, very similar to the lines of the other speakers that have been talking just before me. That's potential lines of inquiry thinking around things like institutional interfaces. So what kind of political or regulatory mechanisms could engage, enable meaningful public engagement with um, the kinds of uh, infrastructure that is producing these highly autonomous systems. So like the research industry ecosystem that was touched on earlier, um, that is sort of kind of unique to the AI and ML ecosystem. And then 
like socio-technical specification, who gets to specify the bounds of uh, societal uh, optimization things that are embedded into society? And um, I think another key element here is expanded disciplinary engagement in this problem. So more political, economic type thinking, more legal and regulatory type thinking, um, more participatory design type thinking. And so none of these problems are new. And there are research communities looking at all of these problems um, in silos, I would say. But I think um, there is probably space for more engagement and cross-disciplinary engagement around this issue of value alignment and focusing on more uh, applied, less theoretical, more new term uh, type empirical uh, research agendas. And so it's, it's very cheap to actually uh, criticize and to call for more cross-disciplinary whatever. So let me try and share just really quickly a few examples. This is a recent paper that analyzes the AI alignment problem through the agent and principal uh, contracting model in economics. And so this is, I think, a useful lens where you sort of have uh, a, you are the principal, you have an agent who's acting on your behalf under some contract, but the contract is incomplete. You never actually tell them all of the constraints and conditions around what you want your agent to do. And so in this paper, they actually identify societal institutions like law and governance and sort of societal norms they sort of fill in this missing structure that is missing in incomplete contracts. And so they point out that this is an issue with, um, if we have an advanced optimization or a very autonomous agent in the future, uh, this is gonna be an issue that we have to grapple with. But I think the paper actually misses the point here. Their conclusion or their takeaway is that we need AI researchers to focus on building uh, machines that think more like a human and can think about this um, societal interface. And I agree with that, but I think more importantly is actually think about what kinds of changes do we need to these societal interfaces that would actually enable that in the future? So I think maybe like a slightly different perspective is useful here. One more example is um, I came across this paper recently where there are markets where they match kidney donors with uh, kidney transplant patients who need kidney transplants. And in this paper, they actually went through a community uh, elicitation process talking to stakeholders to figure out what are the values of the stakeholders in this space around who should get a kidney next in the queue. And then they actually went and updated their algorithm they used to allocate kidneys to donors and then sim did simulation experiments and then also empirical evaluation of this new or updated value laden algorithm. And so I think this is a really nice example of actually applied and empirical research around this value line problem. It's trying to grapple with how do we represent values and what is a value, how do you quanti quantitatively represent that and then actually embed that in a meaningful way to an algorithm, which I think is um, a really interesting space with lots more work to be done. It's some of the stuff that I'm thinking about and colleagues are thinking about at the AAS Center. And so I'll stop there and I'd uh, love to hear if there's any questions. That's great. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, no, I really agree with that, uh, that framing of a kind of a near termism being, being neglected uh, with kind of an over overemphasis on long termism often. Um, is there anything uh, and really this seems like a theme kind of I guess throughout the talks, um, but it seems like there is yeah kind of this I guess misalignment of the research community um, and some of that is around its you know focuses and norms and practices. Do you see anything concrete that could kind of help uh, change those norms in research to, to focus more on near-term problems or? Um, I don't know if I'd use the word concrete, but I, I think I, I'm starting to see encouraging trends. So I, I had an extra slide actually, but this is an, a very recent paper from Yessa Gabriel and um, Papa talking about basically trying to bridge, for example, the fact community agenda with the AI alignment agenda and sort of trying to chart what could a pathway from um, current research in this one community to this other community look like and how could these two communities engage. And so I think this kind of thinking and trying to actually um, connect back the dots back to present day work on AI ethics and data ethics. I think is an encouraging step in the right direction. But yeah, I'm not sure about concrete um, progress yet. <laughs> Great, thank you. So at this point, oh, um, wanted to uh, also wanted to give the chance. So uh, thank you so much to Lauren, Kathy, Ben, and Aaron, because um, those were all fantastic and thought provoking talks. Um, I also wanted to see if, if you had any questions for each other or any thoughts for each other, um, because um, I actually was, uh, there was more commonality between your talks than I was initially expecting given the topics. And then we'll open it up to everybody in a moment. I can jump in. Oh, I just wanted to um, restate, you know, uh, reiterate what you just said, which is everyone's talking about the same thing. We're, we're talking about 
how to make our evaluations of AI, our understanding of AI relevant to its actual use. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that I noticed was there seems to be this tension across some of the other talks um, between what theoretical researchers do, particularly theoretical machine learning researchers. So the ways they evaluate things in Ben's talk, uh, the way they think of in long-term things in, in Aaron's talk and so on, um, and people who are actually doing applied stuff. And so, you know, if, if you think about how you evaluate things in, in medicine, an applied field, you're testing whether it works or not. You're not testing whether it's got a good F1 score. Uh, if you're thinking about the ethics of medicine, you're thinking about the direct impact on people, not what might happen in 100 years' time. And I feel like we tend to focus on the parts of the research community that have been very successful in the last decade, which have been you know, the theoretical people building new models and so on. Um, but for the things that everyone that's been talking today cares about, it seems that um, you know, the, the focus should be more on the applied end of the research spectrum. That was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was great. <laughs> Uh, I can jump in I, again with unfortunately more of a comment just because just because I find myself agreeing with everyone <laughs> I'm kind of uh, <laughs> I, I really liked uh, Lauren's uh, distinction between uh, explanations and justifications and the way that I think you know um, uh, uh, Hannah Wallach has a great short paper about um, the difference between computational social science on the one hand and using computers for the goals of like social sciences on the other and I think you know I think there is a tendency in these in research as a whole to, to tend towards uh, abstraction. I think like philosophy and mathematics have been two disciplines which have influenced AI ethics a lot. And both those disciplines kind of revel and just like, <laughs> they just celebrate abstraction as much as possible. Even computer science as a discipline uh, like celebrates abstraction uh, as well and, and getting away from the contextualized details. Um, uh, Whereas I think you know these messy questions, um, a lot of the questions I find myself thinking about day to day are questions of kind of cross cultural values, and how do we reconcile, um, you know, applied systems uh, across different, uh, often for like you know for a company operating globally, systems that operate at global scale, and so I really enjoyed um, uh, Kathy's uh, points about paying attention to local, local cultural contexts. I think there's some really big questions there that we still uh, just poorly understand <laughs> at the moment uh, and I kind of um, I'm curious how but yeah maybe to, to try and like uh, get a question from this I was um, I was thinking about the question of cross-cultural value alignment specifically uh, and and Aaron if you had kind of thought about these questions of, kind of cross-cultural interaction and when systems are playing roles across multiple cultures how can the system uh, possibly, I mean, possibly it's not possible to align with all the, 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 the cultures in the system, um, if you've thought about that at all. Yeah, I think that's a huge uh, issue that I don't think, for example, the value one community is engaging with yet, is like, you're never going to have a set of human values, whatever that even means, you're going to have distinct communities with conflicting values, and so how do you, um, how do you unify that, how do you interpolate between value sets, how do you, yeah, it depends on the representation that you use quantitatively, it's a I agree that it's a huge issue. I don't have an answer. Um, yeah, I, I was going to sort of follow on your comment as well, Ben. I think you hit it exactly on the head there is dealing with application and real world problems is messy. And I don't, I don't see or know the answer. I don't know how the research community, for example, can change the incentive structures that exist around publishing or whatever else to actually encourage people to do messier research, to actually engage more with application uh, domains. There's, there seems to be this inbuilt bias towards abstraction and theory and sort of neat simulated worlds, at least in, in my discipline there is. Yeah. Just to maybe add to Ben and Aaron's point then, um, it's interesting though, if you do, you know, rely on the literature and think about what does end users need or how ethics should be framed, the methodology really requires you to be, um, go mainstream, you know, so part of that's you do a survey or, you know, you draw, you know, draw on transparency and the classic you know, literature around ethics, which is actually very, you know, comes from Northern Europe. Um, so there's there's some interesting questions there about how do we actually define ethics and, and, and end user usability and explainability actually comes from a bit of a lot of principles and, and data, actually. 
So I find it interesting, someone who works a lot with social ecological systems, when I look into these AI social systems, it feels like I've gone back in time in about 20 years. And I think there's, so I love listening to health and I love listening to these other systems because you, you realise they've worked out how to do multiple evidence-based approaches or how do we understand ontologies or trust or, you know, other things. And I think there's something there that we could, we're maybe scratching on here that could, that could come to bear here. One, one thing that um, sort of strikes me in this is, you know, health does do technology assessment really well, obviously, that um, we've got a, a huge apparatus in place with regulations, with um, reimbursement and all these different layers that um, we're, very, we're very good at defining what the use of the system is, defining what the benefit should be, and then actually doing assessments to make sure that benefit is being achieved. Um, the problem in health, and I'm sure this will be true in any field, is that it's incredibly expensive to do that. You have to do real world testing at scale with real deployed systems before you even know if it works. So you have to develop all that infrastructure and stuff. Um, so there is a barrier there, you know, coming out, you know, AI has come out of the, the tech industry and, and the tech industry really likes low overheads, high scalability, um, getting, getting stuff out and then maybe doing some, you know, post hoc analysis down the track once you see how it's blown up the internet. Um, but the, you know, if we're talking about the least high risk environments and safety or really challenging cultural issues, for example, then we really need to make sure that we can get that kind of testing done first. And that, it, unfortunately, it costs a lot of money. And so you need the appetite for it as well. Thank you. And then I, um, I know David Lovell might be working on a mind map. Um, I don't know if you want to share that, David, just to see if there are any, any themes on there uh, to I, highlight. Or... Yeah, look, thanks. I've been typing away as people have talked, um, and I have accumulated a substantial mind map. But um, as for the actual um, sort of themes behind that, it, it, it's difficult to sort of pick anything out clearly, but things... Things certainly inter, intermingle. I think um, we've heard um, a, a number of really interesting perspectives that are sort of like pointing in the same direction. So, uh, yeah, look, I don't have any magic themes, but I do have one question that's sort of emerged from this. A lot of the um, panellists have mentioned um, AI and machine learning applications as supporting human decision-making rather than making decisions for humans the thing is though if you want to support someone's decision making and help them you have to understand them and their context i didn't get trained in that when i did electrical engineering a very long time ago but i sense that this is a change that we as a community need to make and embrace and i wonder what panelists thoughts are about how we going forward and the next generation of people uh, coming to data science and machine learning, how can we get better at understanding our fellow human beings so we really develop systems that have a positive impact? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think it's been mentioned already, right? We need to do HCI research. We need to do human factors yeah. research. I mean, we do need to understand how humans interact with AI. The, the early uh, indications are that, you know, we're, we're in this catch-22. We, we don't want AI systems doing risky things autonomously. Um, but when we engage humans with AI, it just massively uh, activates all these cognitive biases that we're not very aware of at the moment. So automation bias has been heavily described, where humans over-trust computers in their decision making and that seems to come into play very strongly with AI systems that appear intelligent um, and particularly ones that um, the, can provide these sort of pseudo explanations, these, these not justifications but um, association relationships. So yeah, I think that's, that's the deal. We really need to expand this field and urgently that um, you know, AI is already all over the place and humans are using it. And we just don't know what that does. Thanks. I see Aaron had a 
Yeah, I think there's also a place for funding agencies that fund research. I think it's some of the NRMHC categories. If you claim you're going to be doing Indigenous research and you don't have an Indigenous researcher on your team, that's that's a real no-no, right? And so I think there's a role for funding bodies to actually um, implement restrictions on who can actually do research and are you including the correct stakeholders to do the research you're claiming according to do? I think is another mechanism here that can encourage that engagement. Uh, yeah, I, I second that. There's a, there's a principle that's often talked about in, I think, the black rights and disability rights communities, which is nothing about us without us. And I think making sure that, that communities are involved in the building of, of systems that, that affect them is critical. Um, and I, I think, um, sorry, was it David or the question? Um, I think, you know, sometimes you'll ask me, what is it? Do we need like anthropologists? Do we need ethnographers? Do we need linguists? Do we need like social scientists? And like, yes, yes, we need all these things. <laughs> kind of, this isn't like one narrow academic discipline that's going to solve these problems. Um, one of my colleagues likes to say, you know, the, the, the major challenge in AI ethics is not that we don't understand computers well enough, is we don't understand people well enough. And I think uh, one of the things that, that I'm really concerned about is looking at the, the, the people who are building AI, <laughs> looking at the, the dominance of kind of white men in that field, uh, how do we ensure we have a diversity of kind of cultural backgrounds uh, and perspectives uh, in those teams? I think, I think there's been so much blindness to the, the issues unless we, unless we improve diversity in the field as well. And I think it's really well understood in engineering fields, at least, that having diverse engineering fields creates better products. I haven't quite seen the same discussions happening uh, and maybe it's my ignorance in kind of research fields about the importance of diversity in kind of research communities, um, but maybe those are happening. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Um, I want to be respectful of time and we're about at one o'clock. Um, I also want to acknowledge there were a lot of great questions in the chat that I'd been making note of um, that uh, I don't think we're going to have time for, but Connor and Kate and Aaron and Eves and many people were kind of putting, um, putting good questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so we, we are at time. Um, um, I guess I wanted to check. So, uh, David, will we be sending out notes afterwards um, to those who've yeah, sure. Or... So, the, so the intent with these um, focus workshops is to bring people together for the kind of engaging and illuminating discussions that we've just heard, and um, we appreciate that running them for sixty minutes is nowhere near long enough. But that means that we can continue these discussions on another day um, through the Australian Data Science Network or through some of the other forums that are happening. And I see uh, Joanna Batts done online. I just want to do a big shout out for the Prato <laughs> Dialogues, which have been happening. They're fantastic. Oh, They're, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so look, we will capture the notes um, from this and share them and use them as a basis for uh, um, thinking about how the, the next workshop unfolds. Rachel, can you remind me that's scheduled for February the, I think it's the 24th. I believe, believe it's the 24th and I think it's a Thursday as well. I was trying to switch up the day in case there are people that can make one day but not another um, on day of the week. Um, yeah, so we have another one scheduled also. And actually, I guess I had a slide on this that uh, it was not a very interesting slide. It was just my email, um, but feel free to email me. I'm uh, rachel at fast.ai. Um, for particularly if you have uh, kind of recommendations, we already have speakers lined up for, for next month, um, but for kind of for future months, um, because we uh, really hope that this will be kind of ongoing, uh, ongoing series. And yeah, and also just kind of the start of a lot of discussions about really, really important issues in our field. Rachel, if I may, it's a little bit difficult for you as the host and the convener of this to propose a vote of thanks to yourself and all the panellists. <laughs> so on behalf of everyone here, um, a massive thanks to you and all the panellists for pulling together what's been a really engaging and important discussion. Big round of applause from everyone <laughs> online. I uh, look, Can we just, uh, I've just got my print screen happening here and I've immortalized this digitally, but um, again, Rachel and panelists, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah 
Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. And yeah, also thank you to everyone who came. And yeah, thank you. Also, thank you for the good questions and comments. And um, yeah, in some ways, I wish we had more time, although I also wanted to keep it as something that uh, um, uh, people could stay alert for and um, not, uh, not too huge a commitment. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you.